This video is sponsored by Ridge Wallet. 2020 has been a wild year, and I don't mean wild as in... No. What I mean is this. Yo! You see, in case you missed it, over the course of this year's various lockdowns, I managed to catch up on one of the most intimidating manga series to catch up on for any fan. One Piece. And in doing so, I managed to acquire not only a fantastic new story to occupy my time with, not only did I find a new wholesome community to engage within, but I also acquired the ability to finally say that I have seen every single One Piece story. Um, okay, uh, as I was saying, I don't have a single shred of One Piece material left to watch. Okay, this isn't cool. Who keeps cutting me off? Yo! One Piece is the best series I've ever read in my life. First impressions of the photos. Hey, I'm not doing the One Piece movies. You can't make me. Lockdown's almost over. I've already read a thousand chapters. There are other series I need to get to, like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure or Hunter Hunter. And besides, there's like 14 of them. <laughs> Uh huh, specials. Okay, how could I forget? And refresh my memory, how many of them are there exactly? <laughs> so, what you're telling me is I need to watch and review 27 movies. <laughs> oh, yeah? Or else what? What are you gonna do? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what? This isn't too bad. Oh, stop. stop. Make it. Make it. Stop. Okay, don't do it. You win. I'll review the movies. Just please, for the love of God, stop using Windows Movie Maker. Well, it seems 2020 is the year that keeps on giving, and seeing as I spent most of 2020 reviewing One Piece, and since I've already covered all the Dragon Ball films, it only seems fair to cover these two. Though I'm gonna put my foot down here, I refuse to review stories that recap any arc that has already been covered in the anime or manga. Besides, even while doing that, it still leaves 12 movies and 9 specials for me to get to. But you know what? Who cares? If this One Piece journey has given me anything, it's STEMINA! I can't cover all the films in this one video because, let's face it, even I'm not that crazy. So, without further ado, I'm Totally Not Mark, and these are my first impressions of, thoughts on, and review for the surprisingly good, funny, and maybe not so good One Piece movies 1 to 4. Let's get it. <laughs> Movie 1, entitled One Piece The Movie, is a 2D animated feature film produced and distributed by Toei Animation. Released on March 4th on the year 2000, I was 8 years old when this came out. It's about 51 minutes long and was written by Michiro Shimeda, who had been pretty much working on the One Piece series as a writer since the second episode of the series. So if nothing else, I'm expecting these characters to feel consistent with the series. The film itself was directed by Junji Shimizu, and we will be seeing that name quite a lot in this video, as he is responsible for directing the first three films. For that reason, I really hope he's good. However, considering this is the second film he had ever worked on as a director, with the first being 1996's Hell Teacher The Movie, which got a whopping 5.8 on IMDb, to say the least, I am nervous. Oh, also, funnily enough, through my research for this guy, I also noticed that this guy actually worked on an episode of Dragon Ball Super. One episode to be in fact. And what episode was that? Episode 5. Which, to be honest, from a storyboard perspective wasn't half bad. I just hope it's not a bad omen for how this movie will look. Okay, here we go. In a similar way to all the other Dragon Ball films, One Piece the movie takes heavy inspiration from what details have been disclosed most recently in the anime to formulate a plot. In the same way the One Piece series began with the legend of Gold Roger, this too begins with the legend of, and I quote, the great gold pirate Wunan, and the legend surrounding his mountain of gold. Complete with a secret island only accessible through a treasure map, it's a really straightforward and borderline cliche angle for a pirate story. But you know what? I'm here for it. And you know what else? The OP We Are plays and my soul is filled with happiness because that song is an absolute bop. Overall, I really like this movie. It opens with a really funny scenario filled with character as Luffy, Nami, Usopp, and Zoro all get their chance to establish their characters for new viewers. Usopp's fishing, Nami's navigating, Luffy's being Luffy. Additionally, I like that we are starting from a point where Nami and the crew are already looking for Wunan's island. But all is not well as Luffy and the crew are starving. They get bored 
ordered by this small group of pirates that steal their treasure while they are fighting over a single grain of rice. Which on its own is a funny visual, but it also acts as the impetus for the splitting up of the crew in this short story. In trying to get the gold back, Luffy and Zora end up paddling to a sea restaurant with a young boy who really wants to be a pirate. Also, the restaurant is owned and operated by his grandpa. Nami ends up trailing the pirates that stole her treasure in the first place and their captain, El Drago. He really likes gold and that's pretty much his character. As Nami trails him however to the island, Usopp finds his way into navigating the island with these evil pirates somehow. Overall, the new characters that have been introduced seem sort of ill-defined or overly simplistic. However, with that said, there is still a lot of terrific humor. Whether it was Usopp pretending to catch a fish, the crew fighting over a single grain of rice, or Luffy realizing that these are bad guys after he gets shot in the head, this film, regardless of how strong its narrative is, which seems okay at this point, it's more than worth checking out for the character interactions alone. Once Usopp integrates into this group, he gets sort of captured slash hired by the El Drago pirates. Luffy and Zoro can't pay for their meal, and Nami follows too. All of these plot lines are now converging on this one location, the Island of Gold, which is great because really I found the only interesting characters to be the Straw Hat pirates, and they do phenomenally well bouncing off of each other. And seeing as this film is set during a time where the Straw Hats still haven't left the East Blue, the fact I get to experience some lying Usopp and money grubbing Nami working side by side is always a treat. Though I will say there was a moment during the Usopp being taken hostage section where I wasn't sure how I felt about the character looking at the camera and poking fun. It sucked me out of the movie and made me start thinking about Deadpool or Space Jam. Yeah, but I'm a baseball player now. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. Thankfully though, these moments are short-lived and very sparse, and at the halfway point, all four of the Straw Hats finally reconnect. But not before Luffy had been running around the forest tied to Zoro. Their dynamic is honestly extremely refreshing and always fun to listen to. Scenes like these where Luffy introduces himself to El Drago had me burst out laughing. <laughs> In terms of plot and history, we are greeted by one flashback. As it happens, the young boy's grandfather knew Wunan very well and had a falling out with him when they were kids, but not before saving his life years back thanks to a flag Wunan made for both himself and his friend. Which is nice and everything, but the story doesn't dwell too long or focus on the plot necessarily. That is until the very end. Tying things down and moving on to the third act, two fights take place. And one of them I can barely call a fight at all, Zoro pretty much dominates and one-shots El Drago's second in command, and despite Luffy having greater difficulty with the captain, he makes fast work of him too. Out of the two fights, Luffy's fight is easily the most engaging and makes use of some really fun Rubberman powers. Capping off the film, however, we're greeted with a short scene wherein the Straw Hat Pirates, the young child, and his grandpa all discover the remains of Wunan along with his last will and testament. In it, he outlines that over the course of a long career as a pirate, he achieved his dreams of gathering a mountain of gold, but through living that life, realized that there was so much more to life than gold. And I think that message fits and ties nicely with the grandpa's message to his grandson, which ends up being to pursue his life the way he wants. All in all, this film's greatest strengths were found in the character writing and interactions predominantly, which I did anticipate. And while I don't think the various plot lines mixed very well and the antagonist felt very flat in one note, the visual presentation was consistent, the script was beaming with personality, and the ending had a simple but sweet message. All the while set in a section of the story I hadn't gotten to experience since the beginning of my One Piece journey earlier this year, which was strangely nostalgic. It's nothing special, but it's a fun little film that doesn't last too long to outstay its welcome. Worth checking out, but only if you're a big fan of the characters or series. The second film, One Piece Adventures on Clockwork Island. One Piece Adventures on Clockwork Island is a 2001 2D animated feature film released March 3rd of that year and was produced once again by Toei Animation. It's about 55 minutes in length and was written by Hiroshi Hashimoto. This would be only his second ever time writing for One Piece, with the first being a TV special a year prior. Because of this, I didn't really feel the same connection to the characters in this film. And I'm gonna say that from the outset. Having looked into his background, it seems as though he's not worked on much at this point in his career. With the most 
little scripting work coming his way through the hit anime Yu Yu Hakusho in the early 90s. But with that said, this film really surprised me in a good way. Now, it's nothing super complicated. Essentially, it follows a plot where one character is kidnapped and they gotta get after them. And to be honest, when this movie establishes its opening, I wasn't a massive fan of it. Though, I want to preface this by saying this movie really surprises me in a good way later that retroactively makes the opening much better. Unlike the last film, which had the crew run into trouble with unsavory characters because they were both in the same area looking for the same treasure, this film starts off with the crew losing their ship, aimlessly pursuing its vague direction for a week with no success, before randomly running into a couple of thieves that happen to know the ship, know who took the ship, and who are going in the same direction the ship is in, for seemingly totally unrelated reasons, which, when watching this for the first time, this felt like a pretty contrived opening, but not one that ruined my experience, and I got over it pretty quickly. Thankfully I did, because it gets much better and makes much more sense later. However, once the plot gets moving, this film begins to show why it's worth checking out. The action and animation ramp up in a big way. It's obvious that this film's scope is much bigger and has a vastly different cast of animators working on it. As soon as the Straw Hats begin throwing hands with the very pirates they've identified as thieves, there's some wonderful action-filled tracking shots following various characters as they both fight and run away from their respective opponents, culminating with the bad guy pirates taking with them an unconscious Nami wearing Luffy's hat. It should also be noted at this point that Zoro's swords were on the merry-go also, and thus they need to go after the thieves to get back those two. It's essentially a smorgasbord of motivations by which the Straw Hats will be drawn into conflict to fight. And this is when we meet the bad guy of the film, and this bad guy looks ridiculous. His name is Bear King, and he's building a large cannon so that one day he can become the king of the pirates too. He wants Nami as his bride, all the while Luffy and co are making their way up Spiral Tower. Now, Clock Town, the town surrounding the spiral, is really pretty, and the architecture in general in this film is top-notch. There's a decent amount of work having gone into this town surrounding the tower to enjoy for any viewer. But on a dialogue front, there's a really sweet interaction between Luffy, his crew, and these two folks that look like they have ice cream on their heads. In it, these two try to encourage Luffy and them to run, citing that their life will be worthless if they die. Luffy says it's worthless if they run, too. And despite what I said about the character interactions on the writing front, this film really does succeed in a lot of ways in getting those biting pieces of dialogue and insight into Luffy's character. So it has that going in its favor, too. At this point, the crew are floating up to the destination to confront Bear King when someone fires at them and this happens. I'm on off! No! No! Ah! I was not expecting this to be this graphic. I mean, look at all of that blood. It looks so painful and I winced when I saw it first. Needless to say, Sanji gets captured and the rest float up in the balloon. They stop outside the gates of the main building and I like how Luffy sees a lot of himself and Shanks in these two that have accompanied them on this adventure. He treats the kid tough, but only because he wants him to be tougher. It sort of reminds me of the same dynamic he had with Shirahoshi in Fishman Island, only that happens much, much after this film. As the film progresses, they break through the gates and start fighting a bunch of dudes. Sanji is left hanging above the courtyard in a crucifix, which is a, a weird decision to make for a bad guy to do, but you know what? It's a film and it's happening. Usopp gets captured while being brave, and now both he and Sanji are crucified above the tower. There's some brilliant character animation, action animation, and so much movement top to bottom in this film. And because of that, it feels much more premium than the first one for me, which felt a little more like a long episode of anime. It's at this moment, however, the story actually picks up and swerved me considerably. The grievances I had at the beginning for the less than believable auspicious circumstances that befell our crew were actually not convoluted at all, but in fact a plan by the two people who met them at the beginning. Having stolen their ship, the grown man Barod wanted to use them to return the child to his birthplace on this island. I actually didn't see that coming at all. I thought this was going to be a one-trick film, but it's not. It's narratively solid too. The story is isn't super exciting by any means, and it's pretty cliche in it being a rescue, raid, the castle type story, but the writer decided to add a bit of effort and spice into this tale, which I'm honestly very happy about. And what's better is that this Borod guy throws Luffy's line about running away back at him, which is a nice little cherry on the top of this that I never expected.
expected. And this is all happening, by the way, when Luffy and Zoro are on the verge of being crushed by this ceiling. And this is when Zoro gets attacked by one of the henchmen under Bear King's control. And now, suddenly, there's some decent tension too. Zoro is down, and now it's just Luffy on his own with all of his crew ready to be crucified. Still not sure why that has to be like that, but okay. All the while, they're ready to use this big king cannon. And that's when the kid wakes up near Luffy, who informs him that Barod went to fight the card pirates alone. The kid runs towards the action, leaving Luffy alone again, struggling to hold the ceiling. We cut to the main chamber where the Bear King is charging his cannon to fire when suddenly Barod arrives on the scene covered in explosives. However, despite his intentions, Bear King thrashes him about and disarms the situation. And at this point in the film, everything starts coming together in a really nice way. Like, throughout this film, Luffy has seen himself in the little kid and has tried to encourage him in a direction that he thought might benefit him, which has unfortunately led him into the chamber to defend Borod. Unable to do anything against him, armed only with a brave good intention, his fate is seemingly sealed. This was a cool as heck scene followed by Luffy accidentally getting the rest of the crew free in a dangerous and convenient way, but it's only a small thing, so I'm not too bothered by it. It was done, I'm assuming, as a way to lighten the mood after a somewhat tense moment. What follows this is a series of short but extremely well animated fight scenes with each individual straw hat duking it out with another henchman from the card pirates. First up is Sanji versus Spiky Ballman. Again, I'm terrible at remembering these secondary character names, so he's Spiky Ballman. Again, this fight is short-lived, but the choreography is wonderful and it's stupidly well animated. Usopp versus Flying Fart Man was a super short but fun little skirmish, featuring some good old-fashioned lying on behalf of Usopp as well as some attacks from his classic arsenal like the Rotten Eggs. It's nostalgic to see this. Zoro's fight with Scarface Man was also a little disappointing. The animation wasn't bad, just a lot more limited than the other battles thus far. Still though, it served its purpose and made Zoro look super cool in the process, which is why most people love him at the end of the day. And finally, before the big, big fight between Luffy and Bear King, Nami was given the short end of the straw and simply locks her opponent, Shiny Water Girl, into a jar with lots of tape. That's it. It's literally like three seconds. Okay, on to the main event, I guess. Luffy versus Bear King is the fight that has been built up to throughout this film, and early on in their tussle, it's established that he has a body of steel and cites that a rubber man stands no chance against him. That is essentially the prevailing narrative going into this confrontation, and it's observing how Luffy navigates his way out of this situation that will be his challenge. And once again, this film surprises me with how good it manipulates and takes advantage of where your attention is. Focusing on the fight between all the different Straw Hats while watching Luffy I was essentially waiting for him to deal the final blow, but instead, through once again great animation, we watch him struggle. And that's when something happens that I completely forgot about. Barod, now sitting in the cannon of the Bear King's creation, fires on the captain of the card pirates. However, he dodges and shoots in retaliation, much to Luffy's despair. And then... Jesus, there's so much drama in this film, and I'd be lying if I said that I saw this one coming too. I absolutely didn't, and it really caught me off guard. Feeding off of this motivation, Luffy uses it to throw Bear King into a wall. Catching a blast from his cannon, throwing it right back at him, the tower falls, and so do the card pirates, liberating the city beneath, and ultimately, the child's homeland. It turns out the ice cream hair lady is the mother, so... That's nice. But overall, having now finished this film, I can say that my initial thoughts on it really turned out to be wrong, with the narrative showing us its true hand in the second half. There's a lot more going on under the hood in this film than I once thought going into it, and honestly, it impressed me. Specifically when compared to movie one, which, while fun, felt like an extended episode of the anime. This, on the other hand, both on a visual and even a narrative level somewhat, felt like something one would see in theaters. Kind of. Filled with wonderful, action-packed, and expressive animation. Adventures on Clockwork Island is a film I would say even new fans of the series could enjoy. This video is brought to you by Ridge.com slash TNM. Most people are still using wallets designed in the 1990s and in this modern landscape, it's seriously outdated. And I should know. I've been using the same wallet since I was 15 years old and that means I've been using some outdated wallet for the last 14 years of my life. In the same way phones have gotten more practical and compact over the last few decades, so too have wallets and it's honestly made a massive difference to my pockets. Personally, I hate having cumbersome items in there and this totally fits my new lifestyle. It holds 
up to 12 separate cards, plus room for cash, and there's over 30 different colors and styles, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium to choose from. And if that wasn't enough to win you over yet, check out their 30,000 five-star reviews. The durable nature of each of these wallets comes with a lifetime warranty, so in theory, you could buy this one wallet and carry it for life. And the Ridge team have told me that they're so confident that you like it that they'll actually let you test drive it for 45 days. That means you can send it back for a full refund if it's not up to your own standards. Right now, there's a special offer going where you can get 10% off with free worldwide shipping and returns. And you can get all of this by going to ridge.com slash TN and using the coupon code TNM. Link is in the description. Next up, One Piece, Chopper's Kingdom in the Strange Animal Island. I didn't like this movie. One Piece, Chopper's Kingdom in the Strange Animal Island is a 2D animated feature film that made me want to stop watching these films. <laughs> Released on March 3rd, 2002, it was once again produced by Toy Animation and written by the same fellow that wrote the prior film. It's 56 minutes of what I consider boring and felt completely different to the last film despite it being written and directed by the exact same people. They arrive in an area, Chopper is crowned their king because of his devil fruit powers, and the artwork in this one makes it look as though everyone is sort of coated in oil. It's not something I think looks very nice personally. The plot is pretty simple. The bad guys want horns and they call them horn eaters. There's a boy on the island that gets stranded there after his father was killed by some evil biologist. I don't know. These folks on the island seem to be playing music to get these big creatures to charge and knock out the ones with horns. And then they cut off their horns, all to feed their master who seems to be looking for particular horns to grant a particular effect. After this, the Straw Hats and these evildoers encounter each other where they exchange in what I've dubbed the super ultra mega exposition scene. In this scene, Nami's plan to get information out of them subtly fails and therefore she has to explain it to all of us. Every new character describes themselves and pretty much reinforces the trend of all villains in these films being terrible. And the big bad pretty much goes on a two minute spiel talking about his plans and how they've been implemented thus far. He does this despite not wanting to tell them anything. I hate scenes like this. This is a movie. Show me the plan in action such that I understand it. Stop shouting the plot at me. This big bad guy with the violin, Luffy then begins going nuts and knocks them into a ravine and ultimately safety. This entire conversation was wall to wall exposition in the most clunky way. And if that wasn't enough, when they fall into the water, which is a considerable distance away from the evil biologist and his henchmen, they decide to hitch a ride to the Animal King. And would you look who's there in the forest overlooking their decision to go? It's those exact evil people. How did they even get there? This film also suffers from what feels like, to me, very slow pacing. In a nutshell, the story is Chopper gets taken in by the locals as their king, Luffy and the gang get stranded, Chopper is asked to solve the island's problem, Luffy and them run into the island's problem, then they run into Chopper. It's super simple and really has no extra depth worth exploring, at least none that I noticed. When so the first 30 minutes felt like 90 minutes to me. The evil dude shows up, but once again, Luffy can't engage. This time because coincidentally, he's trapped the only other two fighters of the crew, Sanji and Zoro, in a cave because he's too fat to leave after eating. And naturally they show up on the scene only seconds after Chopper ran off to deal with the issue. Okay, we're almost done. We're finally at the main portion of the film, the one where all the major players get to face off against the forces of the rival crew. First up is Zoro against Big Old Faced Man. Second is Sanji against Stripey Slimy Handsome Man. And lastly, Nami and Usopp deal with the herd of beasts. All of these fights are easily the highlight of the movie, but really, if I'm honest, felt really mediocre. Sanji and Zoro win after they get beaten on for most of the fight just by trying harder, it felt really dumb. The main fight, however, featuring Luffy against the main guy was sort of cool. He's after eating the golden horns, don't ask, it's a long story, and has turned into a big monster. The fight is shot somewhat well too, and looks as though it's received most of the attention in the film. The animation itself is fun, and the staging is much more tense. Chopper tries, but fails. The kid tries, but fails. And then Luffy tries again, smashing that no good man's horns. The end. 
To be perfectly honest, I didn't vibe with this one at all. It felt a lot more like an abridged version of a really boring filler arc in the anime than an actual movie with planning and a large team behind it. So far, it's the worst one and the only one I've actually disliked. You might like this one if you like Chopper, but even he doesn't do much in this film. If you're really bored and love One Piece more than life itself, then you'll love this too. But for me, it just wasn't the best, though did look pretty from time to time despite everyone looking like they're covered in oil. Last up, One Piece, The Adventures of Dead End. One Piece, The Adventures of Dead End is a 2003 film produced by Toei Animation that is over an hour and a half long. This is by far and away the best film of the four, and I mean by far. While I enjoyed movie one as a characterful, fun romp, it felt more like an extended episode of the anime. Movie two was a bit better again, the animation was on another level, and the narrative was surprisingly engaging, specifically towards the end, but the villain and the other antagonist felt very one note. And finally, movie 3 was garbage in my opinion. But this movie 4 feels massive in scope, has superb storyboarding, and honestly elevates every single scene it has. The writing is great and features some of my favourite scenes I've seen the Straw Hat Pirates partake in, and if I'm being honest, it's exactly what I thought a good One Piece movie should look like. From the very first scene, it's abundantly obvious that this film was made with considerably more resources than the prior. Stormy seas, watching from the perspective of the marines as they pursue the Straw Hat Pirates. I found this fascinating and incredibly potent when it came to setting the tone and establishing these pirates for would-be first-time viewers. They come off as intimidating and elusive, and that's something this film does a fantastic job of, establishing the tone of its characters and divulging information in an elegant and engaging way. And that's not all. This has one of the most interesting and effective openings to a film I've seen comes packaged with this one too. Immediately following this scene, we follow this 3D tracking shot, which for the time of 2003, is spectacularly done. Twisting and turning through narrow passageways, it really helps to convey this sense that we are on a pirate-dominated island, passing unsavory customer after unsavory customer before finding ourselves in this little hole in the wall tavern looking at Luffy's wanted poster. And that's when it hit me, just how effective this opening was. In the first two scenes, the film makes the world feel more real and lived in than perhaps any world I've been introduced to within an anime. The seas are vast and dangerous, the town's densely populated and teeming with life. World building has been such an integral part of what makes One Piece feel like One Piece, and I think this film achieves that and more within the first five minutes of the feature. Unlike manga or episodic anime, they don't have a ton of time to dedicate to world building, and so what time they do dedicate to it needs to be effective. And this totally achieves that. It makes the Straw Hat crew feel small, and yet there's Luffy's poster. It shrinks them and then elevates them before introducing us to the crew all sat around a table having brilliant character exchanges. And the way this is framed from top to bottom implies a wider, more active environment. Whether it be while they're eating, chatting, or when Nami walks up to the bar, always see the other patrons drinking, chatting, and having a good time. This feels like a dingy old hole in the wall bar, and I love it. And while this might be a small thing, I think it's the first sign of a movie taking itself seriously. This movie shows instead of telling us the exposition. For instance, remember in the last film, movie 3, when we had that super boring and monotonous expository dump? Well, we don't get that in this film. Instead of the barman suddenly telling us that there's a secret passageway, we as an audience are shown some shady dude slip him 200 berries before moving somewhere else. So going in, we know that barman knows something. And even while Nami's probing the guy for info on how to get some quick cash, he barely tells her anything. And that very instance, that very lack of information, is what makes the ultimate reveal of this underworld pirate town so engaging and stunning when it is unveiled. And once it is, this movie does something none of the others did. Introduce us to new characters in simple but interesting ways and get this, they aren't wood note or boring. Now, with that said, the big bad of this feature does share a borderline inappropriate amount in common with Crocodile from Alabasta. From his appearance, to the way he speaks, to even how he conducts himself, and don't even get me started on the similarities between their devil fruit abilities. But you know what? If you're gonna look at any One Piece villain for inspiration, it's Crocodile, so I can at least get on board with that sort of train of thought. But anyway, yes, there's a fight scene, and damn is it good, helping us get acquainted with this Bruce Lee cosplay dude called Shuraya, and of course, the big Croc himself, 
guest party. The choreography here was fantastic. My personal favorite portion being when Shuraya kicks over a table, uses it as cover before jumping back into some wonderful animation. This is what it looks like when we get great animation coupled with some terrific storyboarding. You get a seamless stream of quality that blends multiple artist cuts of animation together in a brilliant way. This coupled with some classic and cheeky Luffy dialogue only reaffirms this as my current favorite film. Through this scene in the Pirate Underworld, we learn that there's a massive race and that winner gets 300 million berries. Gaspardi is the current favorite, obviously, and the presence he has within this underworld can be felt whenever someone brings up his name. Nami, confident as ever and really wanting the money, signs them up and naturally Luffy is more than excited to participate. One clever writing choice I noticed also was to utilize Robin's shady past to the script's advantage. Anytime the crew had a query while they did bother locals and ask them, Robin was able to answer many of their questions they had as she reveals that she had already been there at one point in her life when she was younger. It's subtle but it's a nice way of including a character's backstory in a believable way to benefit the script in terms of its pacing. This film also utilizes the subplot mechanic wonderfully. We see the point of view of an old man and this young kid as they're aboard Gaspardi's ship. The old man is in a terrible condition and the kid only wants to help him and Gaspardi forces him to do it on his own, forcing the kid to run off into the night to try to find money for medicine. When the next day arrives, Luffy and the crew are sailing up this mountain, essentially towards the starting point of this race. And once they get to the top of this mountain, it's a breathtaking shot that captures every single individual within the crew and their personalities. It really makes this race feel wild, dangerous, and beautiful. Around this time, Zoro notices that there's a stowaway in the ship, and he tries to kill Zoro. And these scenes with this little kid mingling with the Straw Hats are easily the most heartfelt out of the films I've seen so far. And once Luffy and the crew arrive to where their eternal poses were pointing to, they realize this entire race has been a trap rigged by Gasparde. Taking this motivation to confront him, Luffy challenges this little kid, and it's truly touching how he riles him up before saying that he will be laying down his life to help him too. Closing in now on the third act of the film, we get a fight between Shuraya and Needles, Gaspardi's henchman, and it was fantastic. The flow of this fight felt natural. It wasn't anything more than it needed to be, had some really nice angles, and the best part was, it had a great psychological element to it. Shuraya had a strategy and came off as very clever with every split second decision he needed to make to overcome what looked like a stronger opponent in Needles, using the very ship itself to disarm him and eventually knock him overboard. It's a really great fight scene that I encourage anyone to go check out. This also helps to break the trend of having Sanji and Zoro attack the lesser henchmen, instead having them do little bits here and there to help Luffy out both in physical altercations and nuanced emotional situations. It made for a much more natural and enjoyable experience in my opinion. As the fight gets underway between Luffy and Gasparde, Shuraya starts getting in the way of Luffy again and... <laughs> Luffy punches the ever-loving hell out of him to the side. This action of Luffy stopping him from throwing his life away, all the while swelling with the music, it really felt massive and monumental. It's a great moment. The fight that ensues is also helped greatly by the fact that Luffy's hat is in tatters and the weather is tragically bad. Though I will say I thought the battle between Shuraya and Needles was more exciting and well handled, Luffy versus Gasparde is still a commendable effort and makes use of some clever tactics in its own right. However, soon it comes to her attention that the old man is choosing to stay below deck despite the impending cyclone and it looks like is willing to die alongside his boiler that he worked with his entire life. When the little kid learns the news he loses it. Once again leading to Zoro having to knock him out and it's at this point Chopper reveals that he was in fact a little girl all along. The camera then shifts perfectly to Shuraya once again signifying that she is in fact his little sister. This totally took me by surprise and with the worsening situation the cyclone clone impending and the ship effectively being a ticking time bomb thanks to the boiler, the tension rises to a fever pitch. This was such a fun portion of this film and then... The ending to this film is sufficiently large scale for the occasion and the dialogue is snappy and clever. This is peak Luffy dialogue. He's snarky, brazen and lighthearted. However, one thing that did take away from this altercation for me was the fact it shared so, so much with the crocodile Luffy fight. Instead of turning to sand, he can turn to liquid sugar and instead of water, Luffy uses flour to combat this ability. And really, it ends in a similar way too. 
Which is a shame because I really thought this film had enough going for it to justify its own ending free of any comparison to existing material in the manga. What's more is that despite the fight being massive with explosions and sinking ships, the old man ends up saving both Luffy and Shuraya. He does this despite needing medicine earlier in the film and even later on in the film barely being able to walk down a set of stairs. This felt very forced if I'm being honest and was the only portion of the film where I felt I was cheated somewhat. With with that said, the ending proper is heartfelt and has some typical One Piece philosophy. Look to the future, trust in those that you love, and try your absolute hardest to achieve your dreams. Despite that hiccup at the very end and the numerous similarities between Croc and Gasparde, I sincerely think that this film is more than worth a look at. Even if you're not a fan of One Piece, it's worth checking out. You're sure to find something here that's both enjoyable and engaging. I had a blast with this one. And that makes four films. Next week, I'll be tackling movies 5, 6, 7, and 10. I'm skipping movies 8 and 9 because I'm only covering original new stories. There's no recaps here, folks. But that'll do it for this week's video. I've been Totally Not Mark. I'll see you all next week, and thank you all so much for watching.